Okay. All right, now that I get to be self-conscious for a second. Hello, I'm Lyndon. I am a, an illuminator and a terrible calligrapher, and I make a lot of scrolls for both AmpGuard and SCA. I'm originally from the CK, but mostly I call the internet my home, and I'm teaching today at my adopted shire of Griffin's Heart. I have linked the uh, handout, guys, and you're welcome to look through that. So today we're going to be talking about making handmade scrolls in my style. And by my style, I mean in a historical style, because I paint in the same fashion that you would have painted if you were painting books of hours or official documents during um, what we would call our time period historically. Um, I, I also make awards for SCA, which I already said. So a lot of my practices are very historically accurate, and some of them are not because we're still making art here and we should still use tools. Okay, so the first part of the introduction of the thing, and I'm not going to read from it because that's terrible, but essentially it says that you shouldn't be intimidated by doing handmade scrolls. Whenever you're putting time like this into something, whenever you're spending your effort to make something you're giving someone else beautiful, they're going to be excited about it. And you shouldn't like look at your efforts and go, that's not good enough. You should give with joy the thing that you made for the person you made it for. And it doesn't have to be an award. It could be an awesome bit of RP prop or a letter to another group inviting them to your event or a thank you note to someone who did a really good job or something like that. You can do just about anything. You can send in character letters to other people in your RP server. You can um, make a prize scroll for a person who who is going to win a tournament and fill in the name after the fact. Uh, you should always ask around your local kingdom, and you guys are in 13 roads now, so you can talk to your principality officers and see if they have awards they would be willing to let you do by hand. Um, it's good to have like kind of an album of your practice pieces and what you've done before so that you can show people that you know what you're doing. And that can be just like pictures of your calligraphy or pictures of you doing drawn out stuff or little bits of illumination or whatever you like. Or um, you can also volunteer to paint heraldic things like people's heraldry, like with all the fun mantling maybe, or helmets or whatever you like. Um, just don't forget to offer. Offer to your local group, offer to groups near you, offer to groups far away. And come and join the AmpGuard Scribes Guild because we try to encourage you and also people will bring commissions there that you can take up, whether for donation or for money. Um, okay. So on the thing, I've got like things that you need. This is a pretty complete list of all the stuff that I carry around. Um, but below that, it has a bare minimum thing. And the things you need there are clear rulers, heavy hot press watercolor paper, gouache, sketching and throwaway paper, two water containers, pencil, paintbrushes. And if you're gonna use a uh, nib calligraphy, you want a nib and a pen holder, your ink and some inspiration and paper towels. There are a lot of extra stuff up here that like you don't have to have like a, um, like I recommend having calligraphy practice paper, which has these slanty lines on it that help you get your uh, your calligraphy in the right angles. You don't have to have that. And if you're interested in trying it, you can, if you Google free calligraphy paper, you can find places where they will just print it for you and they'll give you a template and you just print it out on your own paper. Uh, painter's palette. It usually just looks like this. It's just a plastic round, no big whoop. Um, you can have fancy ones, you can have dirty ones. Sure. Wash the paint that we're going to talk about today dries, and then you can just re-wet and use it again, just like watercolor. I think you should show off your cool one that you got. Ooh, the one that I got. This one? Yes, it's so cool. The linden leaves? 
Yeah, this is actually my badge in the SCA. I have five linden leaves around the edges. Um, my um, my lovely woman at arms, uh, Melody Song Taylor, made that for me. And I adore it. And I use it all the time. All right. Do you guys know what nibs and pen holders look like? So this is a pen holder. This is a standard like speedball pen holder. If you get, if you have problems with your hands, I recommend this guy. It's got a little bit of a cork thing on it. And on the end of this thing, there is a circle mount where you stick your nibs in. Your nibs will come in all different kinds. You can just go get a speedball set. That's no big deal. Um, this one's pretty wide. This one's really dirty, but tinier. Um, there, and there are special calligraphy nibs and tricks for people who are left-handed as opposed to people who are right. Uh, righty and my SCA apprentice, Ian the Green, is running a really thorough, um, calligraphy boot camp right now on Facebook. And everybody's welcome to join if you would like. They have people giving good feedback, and right now they're doing Unsel, which is early Celtic writing. Uh, light box. You don't have to have a light box. You can have a window. You can tape your stuff to your window. Just, I mean, I used my sliding glass door for a very long time, and it was great as long as the sun was out. But you can also get these guys. These are very thin, and you can carry them everywhere. It's a, a um, this size is 2A. I think my square Christian got that for me on Amazon. They're not very expensive. They get cheaper the smaller you get. And you can use small ones with no problem, but I, I like making big scrolls and this was just easier for me. Um, hot press watercolor, painter's tape. So you're going to use tape to put things down places all the time. I, if you buy very cheap painter's tape, because this is designed to come up, like it's supposed to come off. But if you buy the cheap stuff, sometimes it won't. And if it doesn't, you can use a hairdryer to reheat the glue to pull it off your piece. Uh, you want a container for your supplies so you can carry things. That can be a bag. It doesn't have to be fancy. Um, I don't even think I can leave it because it's really heavy. But I have a... Yeah, no, I'll go and see. This uh, sewing box right here. It's uh, like... it's. It's like a turn of the century sewing box. If a friend of mine's dad made it and they didn't want it anymore and it's the perfect paint box. As it does this. Oops, I knocked that over. Ooh. There's the angel's guy. I need that. One of the things I mentioned in here is an Ames lettering guide. This thing, you can buy them on Amazon or at Dick Blick. It's a, a helpful tool for spacing lines of calligraphy. As you get into calligraphy, you'll learn that like you need certain spacing between um, lettering. So this guy alters itself. This part turns and what you do is set it on top of a ruler and then slide it back and forth with your pencil in it. And you'll get exactly the spacing you're looking for every time. I don't tend to use it very much, but I also am a bad calligrapher. Uh, okay, so let's start at the beginning. You need an idea, and you need something for the idea to apply to, unless you're just practicing. So you need to make a welcome letter for somebody who just moved to your shire, or you need to make attorney scroll for, for something. One of the best sources of, in, of inspiration I have found is the aggregate of images that is Pinterest. If you follow like a couple of people who are interested in art and you just start picking up things, the algorithm will just start feeding you stuff. And if you're interested in the history of the piece, you can click on it. Usually they're pinned directly from museums. So you can look at that piece and other pieces in that style and other pieces in that book or whatever. It's really good. Uh... So you're also going to want to start gathering materials. You'll pull images and put them in like little folders. You'll start sketching things. You want to organize your stuff. I recommend Trello for that um, because it allows you to keep links and dates and times and all that stuff together. Um, I'm not great at updating mine, which means it's not very useful. 
So find the way that is useful for you. I usually use marker boards. Like this thing behind me is a, a dry erase board. And I keep my projects there as I'm going through things and links and stuff. Um, I have a um, pretty severe ADD. And if I don't have it where I can see it, I will not do it. I will not do it and I will not follow through and I will forget the awesome thing that I was going to do because I don't have it in front of my face. Um, okay. Remember that your inspiration can come from anywhere. There's the amp guard. You can use fantasy books. You can use fantasy themes. You can use the bits that you have on your, like, on your bookshelf or Totoro. I made a, a scroll that was inspired by Power Girl once. And I've done ones with lightsabers and stormtrooper helmets and whatever the person you're making for is into, that's what you should do the scroll about because you're making an individualized piece for that person. And it's this gift of love and knowing them that you're doing. Um, particularly for like higher level scrolls and masterhoods and knighthoods and stuff like that. Can All I, right. Can I interject that you should make them cry? That is the goal. <laughs> And it's the goal when giving an award, you're always always trying to make them cry. You want them to cry because you're celebrate them, celebrating them like in the best way. You want them to cry and be excited about the thing you gave them because that's what they deserve for whatever it is they did for the award. Like they're putting in their time and effort. They're putting in their their blood and their sweat and their tears, often alone somewhere like in their house where their time and effort is not recognized. So when it is, you should definitely celebrate them and make sure that they know how much they're appreciated. Okay. So you wanna break down, as you're getting your ideas together, you wanna break them down into individual pieces and start thinking about how they go together. Should you include like pieces of the uh, elements of an award? Like it, if it's like a rose, does it have roses on it? Does it have like references to the pieces that that person did in order to make that, or in order to get the award? Um, like if the person is an artist, you might include images alluding to that art or like tools of theirs. Um, you want to include your chapter's heraldry if it's for your chapter, and you want to include your kingdom heraldry if it's at the kingdom level. Um, and that goes with for uh, personal heraldry as well. I also have somewhere, I think it's not actually attached to this and I should put it in there, a kind of rubric for how you ask people what they want in a scroll, like what colors they like, what colors they hate, what things they like, and not including something that somebody hates is just as important as including stuff they like. Okay, so you want to break apart your pieces and then you want to take a piece of scrap paper and you want to sketch out your whole design. And I know this sounds like you're doing it twice, but you're not. Trust me, you don't want to draw your whole design on your good paper. Partly because watercolor paper has a sort of memory. The fibers will compress and they will leave dents. You will not be able to get all of the, all of the guidelines and all of the sketch lines out of that paper. You want to do all of your sketching on scrap paper or in your computer. I know uh, Kelly in particular does this. Uh, Luminary Al Alona does it in her computer and then uses that as her as her cartoon, which is the part we're going to talk about now. All right. So the cartoon is when you figured out what you want to include, and now you're editing. You're putting them together, and you're figuring out what goes here and as you're doing it you want to think what is the actual point of this thing is this element adding to the overall look or is it just making it busy or is it just detracting from the theme i'm already doing here um and sometimes i edit quite fiercely during this time uh i also tend to keep my cartoons because you're going to use that crap again you do scrolls Often enough, you're going to need a cartoon of, like, your chapter's heraldry. You're going to need a cartoon of your kingdom heraldry, maybe of mantling, maybe of knight spelts or little heraldic shields. So, like, this is Dame uh, Roslyn from Aldegore. This is her knighting scroll uh, cartoon. And it's based on one from uh, that Henry VIII gave out. Except it was red, I did this one in blue. 
And you'll notice though that this is like, okay, so it's like crap on the top, right? Crap down the sides. Yep. This is in the style of an English title. And so is this. This one was for Farrell, uh, uh, Sir Farrell Lynn of the Wetlands. This is his, uh, his wedding gift to his wife, actually. And it's an English title, too. Uh, crap on the top. This is the Pelican for SEA. Same, same thing. I actually used this piece to design the other pieces, and you can do that with lots of different stuff. Um, this is a different kind of pelican for SCA that's based on the Jewel Book of Anne of Bavaria, and my, my daughter helpfully colored it a little bit for me, but I'm still using it. This is the Kingdom Charter for uh, Rivermore, I think. Yeah, it was for Rivermore. So this is the Kingdom Charter for Rivermore. Kingdom Charters always have a circle of the heraldries of all the kingdoms. Sometimes I make it into a uh, like a, a necklace of office. And I always rotate the bottom heraldry to the bottom and then put the, um, this is the parent kingdom and this is the kingdom that was being made. Um, when you're doing kingdom level stuff, knighthoods, masterhoods and stuff, I always try to sneak a phoenix in there because that is the symbol of Amcard. Here's an example of cartoon. This is from a piece of illumination and the scroll that I sort of made out of it. I stopped this one because I just could, I, there was a problem with the shading. It just wasn't working. But uh, you can see how you go from this to this. Does anybody have any questions? No? No questions? Okay. How long does it usually Once take you to make a scroll? Uh, <laughs> I don't count. But I usually budget about a month of my free time to do a scroll. But I paint slow, and also I do too much. Like, you don't have to be as, like, crazy ornate. I don't like to calligraphy, so I will paint all the freaking paper. I will paint as much paper as I can, and then I will, like, do the text in this little tiny thing at the bottom, because I don't, I don't like calligraphy and I love to paint. It doesn't have to be like that. Uh, whatever balance you choose is fine. Um... If uh, I'm honest, I probably spend about a week solid painting like a, a night scroll or a uh, or a bit of um, like an important scroll. Um, if I'm doing something smaller, it might take me less time, but I spend a lot of time thinking about it and how to put it together and like making sketches and discarding them, stuff like that. What was the other question? What size of scrolls do you normally make? Um, so the biggest I go generally is 20 by 26. You want to look at standard available frame sizes and make the scrolls fit in frames because you want to encourage people to put them on their wall. Um, so check local, uh, check your frame sizes and use standard frame sizes. 11 by 14 is a pretty good one. That's what I usually do for uh, baronial awards, stuff in my local group and things like that. Or for like tourney, uh, uh, tourney prize scrolls. And then a knighting scroll can be bigger than that. Poor Peter the Quick, I gave him, I like had this design and I didn't think about how big the design was. And so I made him a scroll that I had to like, I had to cut out a piece of styrofoam that was the size of the paper and tape it to that because my clipboard, which I usually use, which is this big, was too small. So I don't know how I got that frame. Think about your frame sizes. Be kind to your recipients. Don't like make it hard to get it framed because custom framing is way expensive. Um, I absolutely recommend 11 by 14. You can buy a standard package of watercolor paper in 11 by 14. Um, you can also buy larger, larger sizes. Um, I tend to buy 
large sheets of arches and then cut out my pieces. Uh, partly because they come in different poundages and I like using it. And partly because then I only have to pay $7 for a sheet that I might make three scrolls out of instead of paying $50 for a whole package of paper, which I just don't usually have there. Um, okay. So as you begin your design, you're doing the design and you're looking at all your pieces. You want to make sure that you're leaving a margin on the edge of your intended size of paper. Um, I used to, used to call this a page stitch because I was self-taught, but it's actually a margin. Um, and I think about it in terms of a, a ditch you don't go into with your illumination so that the paper can be handled and framed and your design isn't going off the edge. And a piece where this is the hard edge, but like pieces of the illumination can sort of travel outside it if they need to, like flourishes of leaf or something or like the very edges of the calligraphy. Um, that helps me think about it. However, it makes helps you to think about it is fine. Um, here is a larger version of the ruler. These are usually sold in the quilting sections of stores. You can also go to drafting places um, and get really cool rulers like this. You want them to be clear and to have as much like detail on them. I lost my little one. I don't know. It's around here someplace. You want as much uh, detail on them as you can get. Uh, I have like a million of these because I keep thinking I lose them and really they're just someplace else. And then I'll clean my craft space and turns out I have 20. So remember to leave the extra space in your, um, in your illumination. If you want to use art from illumination, you want to pull it up on your computer, you want to blow it up, you want to look at all the little bits of how it goes together. Remember that our aesthetic is not medieval aesthetic. They had different ideas about what was appropriate. Like they wouldn't face griffins to the center. They would both be going the same way because this means you're opposed and this means you're together. You had a so, question on yes. the workshop. <clears throat> I'm sorry I didn't see who it was because it disappeared. But it said, uh, what advice would you have for beginners who are basically intimidated by your skill? And, <laughs> Trace. and then I didn't catch the rest of it. It disappeared. Does any Who was that? Does anybody want to fess up? You should Trace. If you're worried about like working or you're trying to figure out how to draw, trace, sketch, doodle a little bit every day. That's all I did. And I'm not, I'm not a very good artist. I just like shading and painting. So I just work at it all the time. And that's how I got here. Um, I was not one of those people who just like can just go bleh and like make an awesome thing. I work at it a lot and. If it's important to you, then you can do that too. Just spend a little time drawing and tracing and working on your stuff every day and you will get better. You will get better um, at fast and then a little bit slower. And if you ever want to talk about stuff or you just want to work on things and you need somebody to chat with or give you good cr criticism, I am happy to do that. Okay, okay. I guess you, you must have answered your question. So. Okay, we're good. Sorry. Oh, okay. Does anybody else have anything? No? All right. I was going to say, can I comment on that? For yes, please. When I was a kid and I first started learning how to draw, I just picked something I loved and just kept drawing it over and over and over again. And I'm talking, like, we're talking 87, 86. So Ninja Turtles was my thing. And I started learning with that and, you know, always look at what you've drawn and compare it to what the source material is and figure out, you know, what you're doing different than the source material or is your anatomy right? Is your, you know, just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And every now and then you're going to have a breakthrough where you're going to go, wow, I'm drawing the side view of an arm on the front view of a person. Okay. I just figured that out because I learned how to draw from action figures. <laughs> yeah, you just have to you just have to sketch and you have to look at art 
and you have to absorb other people's like look at how other people do things and try to figure out how they're using their lines and just think about it i catch myself like looking at how the light goes through a glass and hits water and thinking about how i would render that all the time you're just constantly thinking about it and working on it and it's i'm better now than i was last year and i'm better i'm i'm uh, i was better last year than i was two years ago and you're just constantly improving in little ways that sometimes only you can see and then sometimes you plateau and you're stuck there for a little while and you're like ah if i could just get off this thing where i don't feel like i'm improving and if you get stuck like that i recommend looking at something else trying a different kind of art or working on pick up leather work or sewing or uh chain mail think about how other things go together because if you're stuck, maybe you need to be coming at it from a different angle. You need to have another art to help inform what you're already doing. If that makes sense. Okay, so when you're totally happy with your cartoon, your design is exactly the way you want it, you can either ink it, if you want to, or you can just erase all your erroneous pencil lines. It helps me if I color in the parts that I'm gonna use and then erase everything else. Um, so I want you to keep your cartoons, which I talked about, and apparently I have a story about a juice cup in my thing. So having your cartoon with all of your design work there already for you is super helpful if something terrible happens to the thing you're working on, like a toddler or a cat or something. So having like your, your piece already done, you've already done the design work, you can take that and you can start over again if you need to. Okay, so now we're going to talk about transferring to the good paper. So you take your cartoon and you tape it to whatever you're using, your light box, your window, your coffee table with a light under it, whatever it is. And then you want to take your uh, ruler and you want to make kind of guidelines on your good paper where it's going to lay. And then line up the guidelines with the guidelines on your under paper and tape it there and then trust price. Um, a lot of people get fancy and weird about their pencils. I just use these cheap retractables, partly because my children steal my tools and partly because they always produce like an even line that isn't darker or lighter and you can just like, you can trace very evenly with them. Um, you can pick whatever you want. If you don't have children stealing your tools, a nice, um, a nice retractable is a good investment. Uh, make sure that you've included everything else. Uh, some people like to wear gloves when they do this, so they don't transfer oils to the paper. Just wash your hands first, should be okay. And wash your hands even if you think they're clean, because you have oils on your hands, and you're going to transfer them to the paper, and then you're going to see them later, and you're going to be like, what the hell was that? It's going to smudge your graphite, and everything will be terrible. Okay. So make sure to use the, to turn off your, uh, if you can turn off the light you're using on your light table, it's a good way to check if you've uh, traced everything. And then once you're done with that, you wanna take your good paper and tape it down to a surface, um, either your desk, if you don't have inclement pets or something that you can put away. I usually use these um, big, uh, clipboards. You can buy them at any art store. They're fairly inexpensive. I have like four of them so I can work on different projects. But the best part about this is you tape your paper down to this thing and then you can pick it up and put it away. And it can't get ruined by someone else who's messing around on your desk like you, Sagan. Which cats. Hey, we talked about the tape earlier, but Painter's tape is the best thing to use for that. Uh, and we talked about paper earlier too, but I just want to go over some other substrates. One of the things that um, Scadians like to use is called pergamonata, which is a vegetable vellum. It's a thick piece of paper that's a little bit oily, and it can come in natural or in like a parchment color. 
Um, a lot of calligraphers really enjoy using this. I'm not a fan as much because I like to paint a lot and pergamon absorbs water in bizarre ways. Um, like if you do big water washes on it, it will kind of buckle and get weird on you. Uh, <clears throat> this might just be me putting too much water in my paint because I came from a watercolor background and gouache is watercolor but isn't. We'll talk about it in a second. And uh, so that might be my fault. Um, also, if you ever get a chance, this is parchment that's made from deer. I'm lucky that in my SCA kingdom, they have a like parchment project where people get together and make parchment and then they give it out to the scribes, which is badass. Um, this is a piece that of, this is a piece of calf vellum. If you, you can't touch it. I would let you touch it if we were in person, but this is much rougher. This is very smooth and buttery and just delicious to work on. Um, the way that light, I used light. So you see how the light just goes through that? The light goes through it all the time. So when you paint on it, it's like the things you're painting are sitting on top of the paper and sort of illuminated all the time. It makes, it's kind of magical. Um, this is a scrap from another project. Uh, if you would like to purchase parchment somewhere, it is can, it can be expensive, but they do have starter sets that are not as expensive. Um, and you can go to per magenta, which sounds like pergaminata, but isn't dot net and get uh, good parchment there. They have packages just for scribes and you can buy different kinds. You can get several pieces for around twelve dollars plus shipping if you're doing like smaller pieces, which are really, really fun and informative. And I recommend you start there if that's what you'd like to do for for scribal stuff. Not start there, but like as you're getting more into stuff, like it's really fun to paint on it. OK, so. Now we're going to talk about the calligraphy. You want to kind of try to match your calligraphy to your art, partly because those things existed at the same time and it sort of like matches differently. Hi, Ben. Hey, Ben. I'm at the window, sweetheart. What's up? I, I was trying to ask the twins if I could have like food snacks if you could have fruit snacks with them. Um, I think they're playing video games right at this moment. Can I talk to you in a little bit after I finish teaching my class? Okay. Thanks, sweetie. Sorry, neighbor kids. Hey, Ben. Hey. Guys, I'm teaching a class. Hey. Fruit snacks? Guys, Ethan, scoot. Mom. No, mom. I'm teaching a class. You have to wait. I'm a part of it. Do you want to come in and help me teach the class? Come here, Goob. I would like to induce, introduce my TA, Eleanor. Say hi. Hi. Hi, Ellie. Okay, so. Hello. Pull your few pens. We talked about the dip pens. You can buy these all over the place, but um, if you want to just start out learning, I recommend, and I could not find mine, uh, they're called Pilot Parallel Pens. You can buy them online. They come in all different sizes. And they are really great practice pens. And you could even just do your illumination, your uh, calligraphy with them without problems. They come with all different cartridges. It takes out the, like, the issue of, like, having dip ink and worrying about viscosity and all that stuff. So if you want something simple and you just want to learn letter forms to do calligraphy, Pilot Parallel Pens. Way to go. Okay. I like to use dip pens because I'm hard on nibs and I use, I like have a very heavy hand, so I push down on them too hard and it helps if I use nibs. Um, if you're doing dip calligraphy, I recommend Sumi black bottle or brown bottle ink. You want to get the kind that's not waterproof. You can buy this at Dick Blick and John Neal and everywhere else. Um, it comes in this big bottle. I think I bought this like three years ago and I'm still using it. I make scrolls all the time. Um, it has this very useful little spout thingy right here, and then you can pour it out for, um, 
You need to use an inkwell for, for this stuff. I use little tiny pots um, and sometimes like, sometimes it's like the bottom of one of the kids' juice cups because that's what I got. And it doesn't matter that much, but if you want to be fancy, you can go get all sorts of fancy. I bought this one for myself for my birthday. Kind of ridiculous. Uh, when you're using your nibs the first time, you want to um, want to clean them with soapy water and a toothbrush because you're going to have oil on the nibs that were that was on there in the factory to protect them against rust and stuff. And you also want to do that after you use them. I am bad at this, and I have ruined many nibs by just letting them sit in ink. And you don't don't do that. Don't don't be mean to your tools. Be nice to your tools. They'll be nice to you. Okay, so. You want to practice the text beforehand. You want to write it out for your um, a couple of times as practice, because the rhythm of learning the calligraphy really helps if you practice the text in order. Um, and you also, if you are smushed, you will trace the area where the calligraphy is, and then you will practice the calligraphy in that area. Can you get down for a second, sweetie? I got to get an example. Oh, where you go? While she is grabbing her example, if you have not signed in, please do. And we give two points for participation in the workshop today. Sweet. I can't find it, but all right. So this is Sir Watt's scroll from Rising Winds. And what we did was trace the area that was going to be the calligraphy and then practice the calligraphy in that space. Especially if you want like a name to be bigger or more prominent or something like that, or you want like uh, you want it to fit in a certain weird space, having practice in the space is super useful. All right, come here, girl. Um, and I I have an example of my friend, uh, Mistress Ellen, who does my calligraphy when I can't. Uh, and she's a much better calligraphy calligrapher than me. And also, I recommend that in general. This was not a job for one person in period. One person would, it wasn't even a job for two people. Like, usually somebody would design, and then somebody else would paint. Somebody else would make the paints, and somebody else would make the ink, and then somebody else would do the calligraphy. Doing joint projects is totally appropriate. And also, it's really fun, especially because doing stuff like this is a little bit, um, you're doing it by yourself in your house. So working on joint projects is really rewarding. Uh, also when you're doing your calligraphy, you wanna keep your text handy where you can see it. And you wanna keep like the text that you're using where you can see it because it is really common to be working on something and just kind of revert to your own style of calligraphy or something like that. So if you're trying to keep a certain look or you want to do a certain hand of calligraphy, which is what calligraphers call the fonts, uh, you want to keep an, what's called an exemplar of the letters in front of you so that you can do stuff. Okay, so I also have example texts in here for uh, knightings and for titles of nobility and for masterhoods. It's good to riff on those things and like kind of make them your own. The thing that you must include are the person giving the award, the place where it's given, um, the kingdom's authority or the park's authority, uh, the name of the person, what the award was, and the date. Everything else is like gravy and extra. So if it's, it doesn't fit and you're only putting in a little bit or something like that, you don't have to. Um, okay. So this is where I talk about the gold work. And this is not something that I imagine everybody's going to get into early. But gilding scrolls is super fun. Um, if you're doing raised work, like, because you can do like puffed calligraphy, uh, puffed, uh, where it's like it comes up off the paper and you can tool in the gold work and it's awesome. Or you can, uh, or you can just do flat guild work. Or are you leaving? Okay, well, bye, Eleanor. Bye. Let's see if I can find my. I'm tech palette. Here's one. 
but you don't want to work with you want things to be shiny and you don't want it to be like i'm gonna handle gold leaf in this weird way and i'm gonna have to buy a burnisher and like work on this and be very anxious buy this thing this is a fine tech gold palette i think it's sold under Cora coriel alice now um it is really almost indistinguishable from shell gold it's about 25 dollars for this thing but it lasts forever and it goes on so nice and it acts just like watercolor so you can just lay it on top of things no big deal I use it all the time. Um, okay, now the paint. So we're talking about painting with gouache. Does anybody know what that is? No. Yep, I, I do, yes. <laughs> I just didn't know how much I needed to explain to everybody. All right, so uh, this is gouache. It comes in these little tubes. You can buy it at Hobby Lobby or wherever. It's um, it's like opaque watercolor, and it's usually called that. You want to buy the Turner, uh, like the design gouache. Don't get ones that say acryl on the tube, because that's acrylic paint that sort of acts like gouache but isn't and it doesn't um it doesn't do the same sort of things that you can do with gouache um and it just it dries and becomes plastic just like every other acrylic you've ever used i do keep some acryl in my kit like i keep a white and a black so if i am doing something that i don't want to move ever if you use the acrylic it will be consistent there was um on the West March Kingdom scroll, their, their heraldry is a black castle with white brick outlines on a red background. And I didn't want the white brick outlines to go anywhere, so I just traced them in in the white acrylic. And it was very fortunate because later that day I spilled a whole cup of water on that scroll. Like a whole cup of water. And the white stayed where it was, and I was able to save it because because of that. Or because I was stubborn and I didn't want to paint it again. Probably the second thing. Okay, so gouache comes, uh, you can buy it from all different places. I usually use Turner, which is like middle of the road, higher end. You go to, especially like if you have a college in your area and you go to the college art supply shop, you can buy these stupid cheap. It's about between four and six dollars for a tube of paint and they last forever you can dry them out in your paint palette and you can use them again and it, they go a long way i got my first ones accidentally in a somebody gave me one of those like um calligraphy kits and it happened to have like two colors of gouache in it and i was like what is this i will use it to paint over here and as when i first put it down on something i was like Oh, so the magic of gouache, which I'm not explaining very well, is that you can come back to it later and wet blend it into anything. I often have to stop my project and go do something else. I have kids, I've got a life, I've got to like stop doing this and go do I can go back and wet blend into whatever, it, you take a wet brush and you can smooth the edges and blend it into the color next to it and smooth that transition if you didn't notice it at the time or you need to fix something later and it is brilliant to work with. I absolutely recommend it. Can I also recommend one other awesome part, the part that I love about it is that you can mm -hmm. put lights on top of darks. That blows yes, my you mind. Yes, you can. It blows my mind. So <laughs> that's why I like it. Yes, you can. So it, it behaves in that way it behaves more like acrylic than it does like watercolor but you can do under washes and wash translucently over colors and it's just really fun to play with and i would like to do like a thing where i teach you guys how to paint with gouache after i send you some supplies if that's okay with gelder um there are two different kinds of whites in gouache this is uh titanium uh and there is also a zinc 
Uh, I always mix this up. Kay, uh, please correct me if I am wrong. But the titanium, I believe, is the one that is permanent white. And the other one is a mixing white. And you can use the mixing white to blend into other colors. And it doesn't overwhelm the color. And the permanent white is just for adding white to, like, just white things. And I know it seems silly to have two, but it's very useful. Um, when you're blending paints... And you're trying like blue and red, like purple, right? Not always. Uh, so this red is a crimson, which has a cool tone to it. You're not, you don't ever get color that is just the color. This ultramarine blue is probably the closest thing to a true blue you can get. But usually it's got something in it. Like this green is cool toned. Can you see how it's a little bit blue? And this red is yellow toned. So everything has a little bit of an element of a warm tone and a cool tone. And you don't want to mix cool toned things with warm toned things because then you get a brown. You get like this muddy purple when you mix um, a bright red or a, a warm red and a cool blue. And blues are almost always cool. So. Um, what you want to do is mix warm with warm and cool with cool, and then you get a true color out of it. You get a, a clean green or a, a, uh, a clean purple in this ex instance. Purple is generally pretty difficult to mix, and I actually recommend that you keep an extra purple in your kit because, yeah. There are also a bunch of different kinds of blacks, and black will turn out to be more matte usually. This is an ivory black, which means it's, it's, from people burning bones and collecting the soots. Um, this is called jet black, but I'm pretty sure it's lamp black, which is sort of oilier. And matte, stuff like that. So I would really encourage you guys to play with it. I'm going to send you some palettes of paint that you can use to try this out if anybody is interested. So uh, please send me a message on Facebook if you would like to be included in the like, I'm going to send you a palette of paint and we can play together game. Okay. So, when you paint with gouache, what you do is outline an area a little bit like icing a cookie. You get your paint to a consistency like cream, and then you outline the area, and then you use the water tension to pull it together. And it makes this very creamy, smooth flat. And that gives you a really great base to paint on top. So you start by painting the flats, like the mid-tones of all the things that are on your scroll. And then you go back and you add the highs and the lows of whatever color, the highlights and the shadows. And because you're mixing into that ground color, everything looks like it's all part of one piece and it's really easy to make very smooth transitions. Okay, so at last, you're gonna wanna clean up anything on the scroll, pencil lines, or things that are like sticking out to you or something that turned out too light or too dark. And then you want to um, take a smooth, clean brush and there's gonna be little lines and little jogs where your, your paintbrush went someplace it wasn't supposed to. With gouache, you can take a damp brush and clean that edge until it is smooth. And I, sa I swear it saves me more times than I can count. On the back of the scroll, you want to include your name in case you're giving it to somebody you don't know or just in general. And you want to include the text of the scroll because usually in court, what they're doing is they're holding up the scroll like this so the populace can see it. And the herald or whoever's reading it can't doesn't know what's on the front. So if you write the text of the scroll on the back, then they can read it. You also want to put, you also want to sign your name on the front. Oh, there are scribes everywhere who are like, no, don't do it. Don't sign your thing. You made art. You made art and you should sign it. And if the person you're giving it to appreciates it, they will understand. Put it someplace where it won't interfere with the design, where it's kind of hidden, but always sign your art. You can do that with like, um, like a little bit of your personal heraldry. I usually hide a linden leaf somewhere in my art. Um, and also sometimes I hide Kelly's because that's fun to me. Uh, and 
uh, put your name and like the year or something like that where you where you would sign your scroll. Okay, now we are at the glossary where we're talking about all the things that we were talking about. I had and your now... mom jokes in mind. <laughs> what? I had your mom jokes in mind. You should do that. That's fun too. Yeah. So, what do you guys want to know? Did I just intimidate you with a bunch of like stuff? Is that too much? I can never tell. You're fine. No? I have a question for you because yeah. you do your cartoon and then you tape it to your light box and then tape that down mm -hmm. and then you draw with pe pencil on top of it. Have you ever just done, because I just straight up just started tracing with the Micron pen so that I don't have to go back and erase all of my pencil marks because then ah. it's done. or painting it directly because I am smart SMRT. <laughs> I I don't because I'm like I'm not careful as a person like I'm just not a careful person so I always trace it in pencil first um you can trace it in ink if you're confident about it why not okay just wondering because like that might I don't know I have a problem with the pencil marks if I don't and uh mm -hmm. because pencil I was using what was I using before I used a transfer paper mm -hmm. for some and like that is not you can't, it's hydrophobic. So the yeah. paint will just slide off of it. Like, here's all of my marks <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Look at all of my outlines. <laughs> so. Oh, if you guys want to try some stuff, I can send you, um, I can send you printable sheets. And if you print it on heavy enough, on like slightly heavier paper than you would normally put in your printer, printer ink is hydrophobic. And it will repel the edges of your paint and help you paint more neatly. Um, I can send you a bunch of, uh, of tracings of illumination if you guys just want to try that. Yeah, I, actually, I did. Um, I have a, a on my website, I have a whole bunch of like coloring your these awards for mm -hmm. people. So, yeah, because you can do that. And that's why it depends on. I haven't tried it with my laser printer yet, but Inkjet definitely does. Inkjet definitely does. Yeah. I I haven't tried it on my laser printer either. Well, I have a but Inkjet totally does. So if you have to, you could go to a Kinko's and do the thing, and it's great. All right. I want to give advice. You should think of a signature. Everyone should think of a yeah. signature. I have a little. I like ATT, yours a lot. A little ATT. Oh. Yes, I know you need my waist measurement, Kale. I'm sorry. It's Is all good. <laughs> sorry, I've been. I took apart my my garage yesterday and started resorting all of my fabric and actually putting it in bins instead of not where it was. And uh, like our whole house has been covered in wool and linen for like two days. And we just got it back in the boxes. <laughs> and I haven't, like, done very much else. Okay, I'm Canadian, so when you bump into me, I'm the one who says sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. Does anybody else have any questions about making scrolls? Would anybody be interested in me sending them a kit to help them make scrolls? Ooh, I would be interested in a kit. Okay. I would also really like to do like a basic painting class if that is helpful to people and also like a sketching class. Um, and Kale, who is my squire from Canada, because we like Canadians today, is uh, working on doing a leather class. Do you want to do tooling or do you want to do armor making? Because you could do armor making and I could do tooling. I can do armor making because that, that's that's a really interesting one. There's so many different styles and techniques that we can teach with that, right down to surround wrap and duct taping yourself to mm -hmm. downloading patterns or just knowing anatomy and using muscle structure to guide your armor shapes. How would you guys feel about that? I am up for just about anything. Okay, I will do the then I will do the tooling class and uh, not this coming Sunday, but the one after, and then after that, it is you on armor. Cool? 
So for just a heads up for anyone who wants to make armor, one of the best books you can get, and it applies to drawing as well, is um, Dynamic Figure Drawing. Because that book, when you look through it, it shows where muscles move when you move. And it helps you design your pieces to not be in the way of those joints. This is a good, this is a good tool to have. Um, if you're looking for books on drawing, I also recommend drawing on the right side of the brain, um, which teaches you to draw, um, draw the thing in front of you rather than teaching you to draw like symbolism. You know how when you're a kid and you draw like the waves of the ocean a, a certain way and the water in the cup is blue and like you're drawing symbols. You're not actually drawing the piece in front of you. You're not thinking about the shape and the way that the light falls on it. And I swear that book will kick you out of that in like two days if you're interested. It kind of reminds me of like Egyptian artwork mm -hmm. how they're very like this is what this means and then they went very briefly into like no we're gonna actually like we're gonna actually show you how you it and then they're like oh no we can't do that and they went they went erased everything and said no we're, we didn't do this we're back to the symbolism everyone's we're all not, like <laughs> yeah we're not doing hy uh hydratic right now like we're only gonna do that for scribes you guys you guys only hieroglyphs for we you we don't understand contrapasto people don't have weight it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll not have that. All right, you guys are super quiet. It makes me worried that I like scared you off or something. I'm going to stop recording if that's okay, real quick. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs>